Hi, Michigan has a question. Yeah. So you say that uh, the the threads in the same warp is coherent in the L1 cache. So if two threads in the same warp load the same address, will you have duplicated value in the L1 cache? No. That part works like a regular cache. Another question for Michigan. Uh, is L1 cache uh, shared between thread blocks that are running on the same, uh, on the same SM? Uh, yes. Uh, again, the, the L1 cache is just, just mirroring the, the global addresses. So, so it is shared. Um, that's why, actually, you have to, to synchronize accesses so that you can make sure that all, all the threads in the block get, get to the same place. If you if you actually want to share data, well, I, remember I a cache a cache is just an accelerator. You just really should think about it as it's the same as the DRAM. It's just faster. That's what a cache hierarchy is supposed to do. I think the question might be along the lines of when you have multiple blocks running on an SM, do they each get private sections of cache, or are they all just lumped together in one hardware structure? Oh, I see. Okay, so you're asking about ev eviction from the cache and and aliasing, or right. not not about uh, data conflicts. Two, two, yeah, two two different thread blocks that happen to be running on the same SM, and happen to be accessing the same uh, the same uh, global memory. Okay, so you are talking about da data then. Yes. Uh, so if they're accessing the same, again, just think of the cache as an accelerator. <laughs> That's really the right picture to have in your mind. So if they're accessing the same global memory address, whether it's through the cache or not, if you haven't synchronized, you're not guaranteed to get fresh data. And you're not guaranteed that your writes will not get lost. Well, you, you, the kernel can't synchronize between blocks, right? Not between blocks, no. Right. Well, this, this question has to do with between blocks yeah. that happen to be using the same SM. Yeah, there's no, um, there's no guarantee. Again. Um, I, I wasn't here at the beginning, so I, I couldn't say this. But between uh, between blocks, since they may run at different times, and they, they may be not overlapping in time and space, so there's no communication between blocks. If you have two blocks that are executing at the same time and accessing the same values. Then they're not. Um, the code is written incorrectly, and it's not guaranteed to work. And in fact, it's probably guaranteed not to work. Maybe I can re rephrase this question here. Um, I think what he's asking. Correct me if I'm wrong. That you just happen to have two blocks running on the same SM, and maybe you have a couple global constants that are global to the whole kernel, and so these two blocks are pulling that same constant by by reading, not writing. And the question is, will the cache actually? Read that. Will you read that constant out of the cache, or does each block have some kind of private part of the cache that it's going to read from? No, the 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 that value will be shared. Uh, both of them will get the same cache line because that that data will map to the same cache line. There's no again the the cache is just an accelerator. It's not um, it's not it's not complexifying the the addressing pattern it doesn't duplicate anything it just just uh, shortens your access latency so the different blocks reading the same address will read it out of the same cache line well think about it this way so for instance in shared memory when you uh, <coughs> declare an array of shared memory each block will get its own private section of shared memory where those values go in the same way, you could conceivably design a hardware structure where each block requests a certain size of L1 cache. It's managed by the hardware, but it's a section of cache that is private to that block. Right. We didn't do that. OK. <laughs> That's a good, it's an interesting idea. Uh, and by the way, the, the case, now that I understand what you're asking for, if, if the, these different blocks, threads in different blocks, are, are reading the same value and, it, and it's a constant, it should be in constant memory, which won't collide with the rest of your cache. Um, 
Yeah, so, so uh, just another comment about, about John's clarification is, again, the, the, the caches are just part of the memory system. They're not part of the specific resources that are devoted to, to warps and threads. It's just a memory accelerator. Uh, the shared memory is, is the part that is specific and specifically allocated along with the registers. That's a, that's a good subtle question. Sorry I didn't understand it at first. I have a, another question online. Uh, this is actually from a couple slides ago. Uh, it mentions slide six. But the question is, if each warp is, if each group of threads is executing the same instruction at the same time, can threads in the same warp hide each other's memory latency? Or do you have to do that with uh, uh, threads and other warps? OK, uh, that's an interesting question. So if threads in the same warp are accessing different memory, and the different accesses have different latency, all of those latencies must be satisfied before those threads execute, if they're executing the same instruction. Let's assume they're executing in lockstep. They're not diverged in terms of, of execution, but they're diverged in terms of data. So other threads in other warps have to hide the latency for all of the memory accesses in that warp. If you executed part of the warp and, and, and uh, not the rest because the memory was different, then you'd be introducing execution divergence, which would, would hurt you later if you can't bring it back together. One other uh, comment about the, the uh, cache line size um, is that this corresponds roughly to the granularity that we're capable of accessing from the physical DRAMs. We're not, 128 bytes isn't because we aggregate together a bunch of transfers from the DRAM. That's about the smallest transfer we can do from, from the DRAM. If you read fewer than 128 bytes, uh, then you just have to throw away the rest, but it doesn't happen any faster. It takes the same amount of time. And um, this is a, a problem with, as, as DRAMs get, get more dense, the, the pipe, the, the pins from the DRAMs are not getting much faster. So um, Moore's Law gives us um, twice as much DRAM per dollar so more capacity uh, every 15 to 18 months or so, but, uh, but not the ability to, to get at it. And the way the DRAM manufacturers deal with this is they have these uh, complicated structures with pages and uh, burst modes. And so when you, when you read data, you have to read a big glob of data. And that's only going to get worse. Uh, we're now in the transition between that granularity being 128 byte and being 256 byte chunks. And by the time the next generation of hardware comes out, it's probably going to be 512. It's going to be the smallest efficient transaction from the memory system. So this, uh, I would like to say that this need to keep everything local and contiguous is going to go away, but I can't. It's just going to get worse. Michigan has another question. Yeah. So the L1 cache is now it's a 128 byte line. Uh, I guess it's bigger than the previous model. Uh, well, there really wasn't an L1 cache in the previous model, so it's infinitely bigger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so the ca I mean, the, uh, I mean the cache line, the cache line is uh, 128 uh, byte, right? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I, like in the previous lecture, they said uh, in order to get the ca uh, in order to get the memory coalescing, you have to the stride should be uh, half at least a half a warp, uh, uh, like a. Uh, have a word separate. Uh, so in this case, there should be uh, multiples of warp warps. Well, it's 128 bytes. That's that's 32 32 bit words. You mean 32 full point? Four byte words. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty reasonable, kind of to expect that. I, I think. think what he was asking is that in previous generation hardware, the minimum size of contiguous data that you had to access to get maximum DRAM bandwidth was 64 bytes. Yes, yes. And now you're saying that we've introduced a cache, and the cache has 128 byte lines. Yes, because in this generation, because the memory generation has changed, the granularity of efficient access in the DRAMs was 64 bytes last time. And three years ago, it was 32 bytes. Now it's 128. Next year it's going to be 256. The year after that it's going to be 512. So that's independent of what we're doing. That's just the okay, DRAM is becoming less less finely grained. Um, and we just picked a moment in time now where where our cache size m happens to match the the efficient transaction size. Uh, now it's not to say that there's there's not going to be some. Uh, some magic or innovation in DRAMs where they, they figure out how to improve this behavior because it is getting pretty pretty painful and um, the the system designers and processor vendors are pretty unhappy with this behavior so uh, you look for some innovation there but I don't see an answer yet good question I have another uh, somewhat tangential question from okay. online is there any plan to support uh, something like SLI inside of CUDA? Okay, that's a good question. Um, and it's the same answer as the peer-to-peer the, uh, -peer transfer of data between GPUs. Uh, plan is perhaps a strong word, but uh, I think it's a really good idea. And um, the, just like with SLI, for graphics, though, there's, there's two schools of thought. And both schools are pretty adamant that they're right, and the other people are idiots. Um, the two schools of thoughts are: are I want to plug two GPU. One of them is I want to plug two GPUs in, and I want it to just transparently everything gets twice as fast, and I don't even have to think about it. Um, of course, that's that's not quite possible. There's some efficiency loss, and uh, because the you know the hardware and the runtime can't figure out exactly what you want it to do. Uh, the other school of thought is. I'm the programmer. I know best. I know exactly where the data should be, how the problem should be partitioned, and I want to control the, the two different parts. So if we, if we build um, a technology that allows the sharing, it, it really has to also still give the control to the programmers who want to do it all themselves. So, so it's, uh, it's certainly a goal. It's something we, we've been working on. It, it continues to be hard even in graphics, and we've been doing it for 10 years in graphics. So I think it's a big, big challenge. But uh, plan is a strong word, but hope and work toward. Essentially, that's kind of what you have now. If you look at the, the Fermi block diagram, it's like multiple GPUs on the same chip. We just need to rationalize the communication. And the problem is that the off-chip communication is going to be an order of magnitude slower than the communication between SMs and memory on the chip. So figuring out a way to hide a factor of 10 is really the core of the challenge here. If we only had time travel, we could solve all these problems. Um, OK. Uh, more questions, or if I press on? Uh, so the addressing for Fermi has been improved from previous generation. Um, we've we've uh, homogenized the the address space so that uh, the same instructions can be used for global memory, shared memory. Uh, everything is part of the same flat address space. And so that enables us to, uh, first of all, make, make simpler uh, object code. But second of all, we can do things like uh, function calling and passing function pointers and things like that. Uh, we, we now support full 64-bit addressing, uh, but we also support a mode where you can continue to run in 32-bit mode. And it's defaulted based on what OS you're, you're running on, but you can override that. Uh, we support. 64-bit integers now uh, without native instructions, but we have a little magic mojo to, to make it uh, reasonably efficient. Um, and we, we haven't seen it as a bottleneck in any applications yet. 